Hello and welcome to the Fourth Turn Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Neal. That's at Chris S. Neal on Twitter. With me on the show is Chris Owens. That's at Chris Owens 62 and Hunter Thomas. That's at Hunter Thomas 08. Make sure you check us out at thefourthturn.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at The Fourth Turn. And this is the fourth turn with Chris Neal and Hunter Thomas. And we've got uh, James Swan on the phone, the winner of the 2014 New Year Street Stock Race. How you doing tonight, James? I'm doing just fine. Good, good. Understand you uh, you had a flight canceled. You were on your way back to Wisconsin? Yeah, we were supposed to go to Chicago first, and they've closed the Chicago airport due to cold and snow. So we found a flight tomorrow morning to Milwaukee, which is where we originally left from. <laughs> so, yeah, we get to stay another evening. Another evening in the sunny south. Yeah, although it's 20 degrees out here now, it's cold. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, it's it's getting getting a bit cold, and, and people are... Uh, uh, you're, you're from up north, so you probably don't see quite the panic. But if you were to go to a no. grocery store right now... Uh, even with no snow coming, with just the threat of this cold, the the grocery stores are packed. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> and and in fact, um, uh, Andy Locklear, the announcer at the track, uh, he's a captain over at Darlington County Sheriff's Office, and he's he's supposed to be on with us tonight. He helps us with the show, and uh, he wasn't able to make it because they are. They got some kind of preparations going on for the weather. So. Yeah, they, uh, oh, wow. they, they actually uh, a lot of schools around here have a two hour delay. Yeah, so. this was your was was this your second trip or third trip down to Dillon? This is my my second trip. Yeah, second trip down. And I was looking at yep. the results. I think from from last year, and it looks like you finished twelfth. Um, and uh, of course, this year you, you you came away with the top position. Um, why, don't, why, don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about the race? Um, basically, I didn't qualify as well as I had hoped. I uh, kind of screwed up in three and four in the second qualifying lap. Wound up sixth overall, so I started sixth. Kind of rode around for a couple laps, kind of waiting for everybody to sort each other out, and then made my way to the front. Sunny Shelf and I swapped the lead a few times. Um, was having a good time with that. About 10 laps to go in the first half. Something broke inside the transmission, and it locked up down the back stretch and let itself go. And somehow it kept going, but it was making all kinds of noise. And I thought at the break we were done. Um, but uh, the car was good, really good. Didn't make any changes to it the whole weekend. Um, restarted the second half, and my wife, my spotter, um, asked me if something was dragging. And I told her that it wasn't anything dragging. It was the noise from the inside of the transmission. So she could hear it up in the spotter stand, how bad it was. So I didn't expect to go more than a couple laps in the second half. And uh, somehow it hung on for the next 50 <laughs> <laughs> and the car was really good, so um, some lucked out, got to the front, lost a couple uh, restarts and fall back a couple spots and then make my way back to the front. The car was just that good. Um, then we wound up getting the win. I mean, that, that was, uh, that, it was actually a, a, a relatively fun race to watch. Um, there were a good number of cautions, but it, it seemed like, especially at the front, the, the guys at the front were, were uh, racing each other pretty clean. Yeah, I was very happy with it. Um, everybody else, I mean, everybody that I saw, Sonny Shelton ran me clean, uh, which I expected. He's one of my really good friends. He's the one that set me up with Jeff Melton for me to come down here. So uh, we ran good together. We used to run together up north. Um, and then the 42 car, we ran good together. The 11 car, we ran good together. The 56 car, I mean, we all seemed to respect each other, which is what I was really hoping for. And I get as much respect as I get back, and it worked out really well. Yeah, it's a nice one to to have a race when you see see those guys. And I, I don't know. I think a lot of times you tend to see that the the cream rises to the top. So the guys at the front are are some of the best drivers, and you know they they for the most part will race each other clean clean. No, yes. And and I guess nobody wants to spin anybody else out because it, you know what he's going to get back up there, especially in a long race like that. Hey, that guy's going to get back up there, and if he can get to your bumper, he's going to turn you around. Right. Um, what What do you think about the Dillon track? This was your second trip. A um, little bit of a tough track to crack at some points. 
It's, I love it. It is so much fun. I can't believe it. I wish we had one like that up north. Um, the best I can compare it to is Madison Speedway up north. Um, uh, we got a half mile that's similar in banking, but Dylan's different. you got to race the track more egg-shaped. It looks symmetrical, but it doesn't feel like it when you're on the racetrack. Pretty good bump into turn one. You can use the flat on the bottom to help turn the car. I mean, it's just it's a blast to race at. Um, I guess, uh, can you kind of talk about maybe your your racing history uh, throughout the Midwest? I believe you're from Wisconsin. And uh, also, yep. uh, how did you... Uh, How'd you hear about Dylan Motor Speedway and and get hooked up with uh, Jeff Melton? Um, yeah, I've been racing for 20 years up in Wisconsin. Um, I've had a lot of opportunities. I haven't owned my own car since 1992. I've been driving for other people since then. So I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, we've had some pretty good luck. I've won 13 championships in sportsman cars, which are very similar to the street stocks. Um, and now this year we just went to Arca Midwest Tour, super late model racing, and I won Rookie of the Year in that uh, this year. And um, like I said earlier, my friend Sonny Schulten, a really good friend of mine, lives down here now. He moved down three years ago or so. We used to race together up north, and he had heard about this Dylan race. And it was probably about a month before Sonny had told me about it, I found Dylan Motor Speedway on Facebook. And uh, I got to looking at it, like, wow, it looks like a cool track. I'd like to come down there at some point and watch this. And Sonny calls me and he says, hey, you want to come down? I got a guy that's going to let you use one of his cars. So I'm like, sure, I'll come down. So we came down last year and had a really good shot of winning it until we ran out of gas. And so um, Jeff was so happy. Jeff Melton, the guy's car that I drive, he was so happy with what we did last year. He invited me to come down again this year. And luckily we pulled it off this year. Since you uh, you do a good bit of racing up north, you think the cold played into your advantage, any? Because we were we were battling a, a, a pretty fair amount of cold there, and I, I noticed, uh, especially in, in some of the qualifying, like I, a lot of the guys were turning around on the first lap or so when they'd go out to qualify. But did you, you, you think maybe you're a little bit more used to racing a car in that type of weather? Yeah, I'm definitely more used to racing in that type of weather. Um, I knew that the tires would be cold and the track would be cold, and you really had to warm up that first lap to get a good lap in qualifying. Um, but you also had to be careful with it because it's really slippery for the first couple. Um, so, yeah, that probably played into a part. Um, and my car was just that good. Jeff and Mark set that car up so good after knowing what I liked last year. They set it up really good for me. Um, so I really didn't change anything in the car. I just had to get used to driving it again. Um, but... I don't know, the car was really, it was kind of slow for a couple laps, like even on the restarts when the tires were cold, it'd take me a couple laps to get going, I was being a little extra cautious, not to cause a wreck, and once the tires warmed up, then I then I was more comfortable and I could get going again, but um, yeah, definitely a cold weather, I do believe, I played a part, I've raced in much colder, I've been around much colder, you never get used to it, but you understand it. <laughs> I, we were a little bit surprised, at, uh, pleasantly surprised at the number of fans that showed up. Um, I think everybody kind of, uh, you know, Friday was very cold, and we expected uh, that it would be warmer on, on Saturday, but uh, the sun never came out, so it never warmed up. Yeah, um, I was surprised also with the fan count. Um, there were a lot of people sparked in their cars along turn one and two down there. I expected those people to stick around, but the people in the grandstands I was really impressed with. Um, and like I said in my interview after the race, I would be one of those people sitting in the grandstands. We go sit in our snowmobile suits and just sit there and watch the races. We go to lacrosse every year at the end of the year, and it's usually 30 degrees at race time, um, usually on Saturday night. Uh, so I'm one of those fans that would sit there, and I was really proud to be standing in front of all those people that actually endured the cold and came to watch us race. So I'm glad we got to put on a good show for them. Uh, you certainly did. We uh, uh, con- congratulations on your win, and uh, I hope you'll uh, hope you'll plan on coming back down. Um, you know they run a run a big sweet stock race uh, in the middle of the summer as well. Uh, might want to look look to coming down and competing in that one as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. Um, cr- proud to get to know some of the people down here. There's some great people, great fans, great friends, um, other competitors, drivers. Everybody's been really cool, really cordial, really nice. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to coming back. Sounds like Jeff Melton wants to build a new car next year. He's already invited me to come back for the New Year's race. Sonny's been trying to get me to come down for the July race, but July is usually my busy season up north. We're racing the Arca Midwest Tour. 
Um, there's some specials at Dells Motor Speedway, um, uh, Madison International Speedway, Slinger Super Speedway, um, the Tundra Super Late Model Series, and we've got probably 30 or 40 races that I could run during the summer. Mm. Um, so July is usually our busy season, so <laughs> trying to get down here in July might be kind of tough, but we're definitely going to try it again. Well, that um, sounds good, but glad to have you down here. Go ahead, Hunter. Yeah, I have one more question for you, James. Um, where does Dillon Motor Speedway uh, kind of rank in toughness and uh, and overall experience compared to uh, all the tracks you visited uh, out we- out mi- in the Midwest? Oh, boy. Um, Slinger Super Speedway is my absolute favorite. Um, I'm going to say Dillon is probably number two or number three on my favorites list. Um, in competition um, technicality and that kind of stuff the track is probably uh, five being the hardest one being the easiest it's probably a four it's really difficult to get to get um, uh, consistent and smooth and to know where the good grip is in the racetrack and, and to be smooth with it and not spin the tires and, and to find the right apex to come off the corner good and it's a tough little racetrack like I said it, it, the back track feels nice and like arched but the front stretch feels perfectly straight like off of turn four it's tight corner into turn one it's a tight corner but off of turn two it's kind of a sweeper and into turn three it's kind of a sweeper it feels like but it doesn't look like that so it's, it's very deceiving in itself and just the, the overall grip of the racetrack there's different grip levels in different areas of the racetrack so it's definitely tricky but it's, it's one of my favorites that's for sure Seems to be a seems to be a really nice driver's track. You know, it's not a track that you can just bring a ton of horsepower and expect to win. You, you're going to have to bring a decent driver to the track. I totally agree with that. Absolutely, do I? Well, James, we uh, we appreciate you talking to us, and uh, hope you can hope you can get home safely tomorrow morning. Um, and look forward to Thank you. to seeing you come race back with us again. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, definitely proud to be a part of it, and hopefully we'll see you again later on in the year and maybe in the beginning of next year. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank Thanks you very for much. All right. No this, problem. Thank um, you. Um, you guys, you guys put on a great show. Um, I, you know, we we focus a lot on, on late models at the fourth turn, but, mm-hmm. you know, the, the street stock class, these, the, these street stocks that you guys run, This, I mean, this is that's the backbone of racing. Yeah, it definitely is. It's fun. I, you know, people people up north, I've been racing sportsman cars for so long, they told me that I've got to get out of sportsman cars. I'm making it boring for them to watch. <laughs> um, so I moved up into the super late models, and nobody ever thought I'd go back to a mid amp car, sportsman car. Um, but I love them. I absolutely love them. But people are like, why would you race one of those cars? I'm like, because they're fun. They're just, I'm, I'm born to race. We ran 56 races two years ago, and the more the better for me. I just, I, I can't get enough of it. <laughs> So it doesn't matter if it's a street stock or a four-cylinder or a super late model. I don't care. I'll race anything. Well, you know, one of the big things I, I, that I really think that people like about the street stocks, especially the fans, is you look at that car that you raced, that's a Ford Thunderbird. Yep. And 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 you look at at the uh, you know the the car the seventy five that uh, that um, Chauvin was in, that's a Monte yep. Carlo. Right. And 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 the fifty six, hey, that's a Camaro. Uh, right. You know, it's, it's not like NASCAR or late models where you're trying to figure out, all right, what kind of car is that? Is that a Chevrolet or a Ford? Hey, I know exactly what kind of car that is. Yep, I totally agree with you. Uh, all right. Well, I'll let you get back to your evening. And uh, all right, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Bye. Make sure you check us out thefourthturn.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at The Fourth Turn. Um, what's the nuts and bolts of the uh, Chase Elliott deal? Um, hopefully that I can read it. Um, his, uh, his dad's going to like test with him. Like he's actually going to rob um, in the test coming up. Um, I think on Thursday. Yeah, I don't know. There's, there wasn't too much information. It's, it's a full-time deal, obviously, with Napa. It's a full-time nationwide ride? Yep. Huh. Um, it, it appeared that 
the story behind it all was more so on Chase running the number nine because that's what his dad did. Yeah. And then him carrying on the Elliot name. That seemed to be the bigger... Because whenever you look at the... Uh, whenever you go look at photos on the NASCAR media site, there's like three photos of Chase Elliott and there's like 15 of Bill Elliott. <laughs> <laughs> like all of his number nine cars. Well, I mean, I think it's probably... I guess it's a big deal because Napa. I mean, if if that Martin Truex thing didn't happen, then maybe Napa wasn't a sponsor, Chase. Yeah, apparently, and that's probably... it just was a, a last-time-minute thing because, I mean, you haven't heard about this until this week. No, and, I, you know, the thing is, you know, Napa was looking for somewhere to go. Yeah. Because they, you know, as of... What, you know, a month ago, they were, um, they were out, uh, um, they were out of NASCAR, period. Yeah, another strange thing is, you know, Aaron's used to sponsor Chase, so maybe they were trying to look at doing something, you know, Aaron's and Apple both were with Michael, um, and Aaron's is going to be with Ryan Vickers next year, but... Again, a few years, it'll be Aaron's with Chase Elliott along with Napa. Yeah, I mean, you never know what they're, you know, trying to work out um, down the road. So I guarantee you Aaron's would rather be with him here than Michael Walter. And I, you know, you, and you, you have to imagine that that basically is going to since Chase, Chase the Hendrix um, development driver, right? Yeah. So you can pretty much guarantee that uh, that means Junior Motorsports is going to be getting some top-notch Hendrix equipment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I guess the you know thought process is he's he's done really well in just about everything he's climbed in. I mean, he's won truck races. Yeah, I mean, he only had nine starts in the trucks, and one of them was a win, and uh, he had multiple, multiple top fives and top ten finishes. I think it was, uh, not sure how many exactly, I think seven top tens. It's going to be interesting to to watch this as, as you know, in, in kind of a contrast to Kyle Larson to see how much they fast-track chase. Yeah, I think Chase will do well, though, because he's, he's just grown up around it. And, uh, I mean, if you look at his, his stats, he, you know, he does really well in the late models and you know, even the dirt cars at some time. But so does Kyle Larson. I mean, Kyle Larson, he wins everything, it seems like. But I just think uh, just growing up around the sport for um, 18 years for, for Chase Elliott is, is going to pay off for sure. Well, and you can't help but figure that his dad's probably going to, you know, have enough, exert enough influence in his career to to keep them from moving him up too fast. Yeah, I mean, Bill, you know, he's, he raced not that long ago. I mean, it wasn't exactly a, a competitive ride, but, you know, he's been in the sport uh, fairly recently. And uh, he knows how it all works. And I mean, I just hate to see them move a young driver into Cup too fast. And yeah, then... I think that's uh, that's kind of what happened to Joey Logano. I think because Joey Logano is just now starting to, you know, be the driver that everyone thought he was going to be. Yeah. Um, I think I think uh, I think he had to move up just because of the Truck Series. You know, it's hard to prosper in that series. I mean, it's a really – it puts on the best racing by far. But, you know, if you aren't winning or if you aren't the top five, um, you know, I just think you make a you know a lot more money in the Nationwide Series. Yeah, I mean, it's a good entry-level series, and it's where most of these guys need to start. But, you know, given the amount of seat time that Chase has got, because, I mean, he's raced – you know, what, what hasn't he raced in? 
yeah over the past and, couple of years so and he'll be in top notch equipment too i mean top top notch uh, junior motorsports is you know known for for doing extremely well in the nationwide series well not only that but you know hendrix development and- oh yeah that too <laughs> <laughs> That's a big, big part of it too. <laughs> I mean, they, they, you know the, that the best engines that coming out of the Hendrick shop are uh, are going to somehow find their way there. Absolutely. I think it's great. I mean, I think the Nationwide Series needs him. Uh, the, Cam- <clears throat> the Camper World Truck Series doesn't need him. You know, the Camper World Truck Series has many, many uh, young stars. Uh, a lot of you know, late model drivers that move up and, and compete in a few races. But the Nationwide Series has been dominated by cup drivers uh, for the past few years. Yeah. And, you know, Kyle Larson was such a fresh face uh, to that division, and now he's going to the Sprint Cup. So it's good to see someone young who has the success and has a name behind him uh, to move into that series to maybe bump up some ratings and uh, put on a good show. I mean, he's only 18 years old, and he, he won the Winchester 400 this year. No, no, he finished second in the Winchester 400. He, he won, won it last year. Yeah, he won the All American 400 this year, and yeah. then the Snowflake. And well, well, he, he, he didn't get thrown out for that race, but <laughs> <laughs> he got thrown out. For the, for the he won the Snowflake, and he crossed the finish line first in the snowball, but he didn't actually walk away from the track with the trophy. No, uh, he didn't win that one, but I think he could have. Yeah, I don't. You know, I definitely think we've we've discussed that before. I don't. I don't. I don't think the the type of weight that was in the car would have played any significant. You know, would have, would have been a significant factor in him winning or not winning. Now, the good thing is, whenever you go back and uh, read the transcript, the press conference he had the other day, uh, Chase is, is very, very humbled to have this opportunity. He knows that this is kind of his one shot to, uh, you know, to being in a competitive ride, not only in the Nationwide Series, but. Uh, in the future Cup Series as well, and uh, I think that's really neat because there's a lot of drivers that you know get real cocky and uh, let the sponsorship and the spotlight just kind of suck them in. But uh, it's good to see Chase is real humble with the yeah. position he's in. What did we have going on over the weekend? The New Year Street Stock Race from the Dillon Motor Speedway. This is what fourth. This is what fourth. Fourth year. Fourth annual. Yeah. Fourth annual. And I, I mean, I, I think that thing gets bigger, bigger just about every year. Um, I don't. It doesn't look like. You know, I, I I was looking at the results and and looking at the total number of cars. Um, and at at first, you know, because I think there were only eighty five cars total there. Um, but I, I thought about it. I think we had one, we had one less, one or two less classes, didn't we? Yeah, I thought I counted like ninety two at one point. Yeah, I, the there were probably ninety two or ninety three cars total that were at the track, but okay. cars that actually took the green flag I I got was you. only eighty five because we had you know we had someone in the wall and uh, um. A couple of guys got torn up and uh, and and weren't able to run. And I was thinking about it. I, you know, it. It seems like there was less cars, but then I looked at it. We had one less class. Yeah, um, it, it was still a great show. Though. But yeah, I mean, it still was. Shoot, it wasn't. I mean, for for racing, um, you know, you you almost won't get a better show than than the one that you got. I mean, it was. It was some wrecks, but um, and I, you know, you and I talked to uh, talked to James Swan, the winner of the the street stock race. We talked to him earlier, and um, you know, he agreed. Most of the guys, especially in the street stock race, those guys up at the top, they were racing each other clean. There wasn't uh, a lot of the wrecking was going on in the back. Um, those guys were racing each other pretty clean, so. 
Um, I mean, it was just a nice race to watch. It was. I was. Uh, I was really thinking that Wayne was going to get him there uh, at the finish, just because uh, you know, just because Wayne is uh, you know local. And I just figured he'd figure out a line and I'd be able to drive in a little harder. But man, James is uh, for his second time. You know, he almost won last year, but he ran out of gas. Yep, finished twelfth last year, ran out of gas. That's that's, that's really good. To, be in contention two years and then win uh, one out two. But I mean, you, you look at uh, aside from from James, who's um, from Wisconsin, but uh, is a, a big time competitor. I mean, raced tons and tons. Um, you know, most of the guys that were up at the top were uh, either Dylan regulars or guys that do a lot of racing at Dylan. They may not be there every single weekend. It yeah, didn't not occur as people was one of the first one ever by the first um, New Year's race. I, I believe he did. I think uh, so. He I finished think third. 17 car. Um, yeah, he, uh, he's Wayne. been getting real fast in that 42. I um, remember uh, last year, I think it was, um, for the Polar Bear 150 at Rockingham. Um, man, he was in contention to win that race as well. So uh, Curtis people is, you know, he's getting real strong here. Uh, within the last few years. And uh, Gary Ledbetter, unfortunately, um, you know, we talked to Gary on the show a couple of weeks ago or a week or so ago. Um, a two-time winner. He was one of the past two. Uh, he finished 23rd. He he was out. Um, I think he was out relatively early. Um, he got taken yeah. out in a wreck, didn't he? Yeah, I didn't see it. I was over in um, turn two, but I saw a massive pileup at a turn four. Um, I know Ricky Locklear was in that. I don't know who else. I assume Gary Ledbetter got on up in that, maybe. Yeah, he didn't. It wasn't his fault. I think it was something that he came up on and, and ended up, uh, you know, ended up getting hammered up in. Um, Tough right for Jeff Mountain, too. 26. I don't know. I don't know what happened to him, but. Uh, he got he got caught up in a wreck really early. We had uh, within the first ten laps or so, they had um, they had a couple of guys that were were getting tangled up a little bit, and I think Jeff got caught up in that and then got caught up in something else. Um, I saw the end the uh, the front end of his car got torn up fairly well. Hey, you can't argue with thirty four cars though. That, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's. Uh... That's that's impressive. Yeah, a lot of street stocks, and um, you know, man, I I just really I, I love late models, but watching these street stocks run because these street stocks, I mean these these are not expensive cars. These for the most part are cars that you can go to an average junkyard and pull a Nova out or uh, you know a, an old Monte Carlo or something. And you, you look at most of these guys racing these street stocks. These aren't professionals. These guys have regular jobs. They work on these cars at night and on the weekends. Yeah, what's so cool about the street stock cars is you can uh, you can really beat and bang with them. You know, the, the late models are real kind of, you know, in a sense, uh, aero dependent uh, kind of. Uh, you know, you don't want to rub fenders and all that with a late model, but... With these street stops, it just seems like you can really kind of hang it out, get it sideways through the corners, and beat and bang, and, and bump draft, and do all that. And that that's what makes this this uh, division uh, so competitive because you're able to hang in there and, and do some crazy stuff uh, to be able to get the position you want. I think some of our best races last year um, at Dillon Motor Speedway were just regular street stock races uh you know with just the top five just battling out yeah they were they were a bunch of competitive drivers <clears throat> um you know racing in that uh racing in the street stock division last year um and that's i it's it, i think the two was kind of impressive was was the fact that you got this guy you know a guy like james swan who, and I know it was a friend of his that, um, you know, talked to him about it and got him involved in it. But, I mean, this guy flew from Wisconsin all, right. all the way to South Carolina to race a street stock. 
Yeah, speaking of that, you know, you had uh, the guy from Rhode Island. Uh, Jimmy Steel, Sylvia? Yeah. And he finished 17th. I, thought, I saw him get caught up in a... He, he actually um, qualified third, either second or third. And he he was kind of the he had not been all that fast from most of practice, and there towards the end of practice he really started stepping it up, and he was one that we were kind of looking at as a sleeper. Um, you know this this he looked like he might really have something for it. Um, he's, he's usually always in contention, but he seems really ag- uh, really aggressive, and you know it always seems like he he ends up. And something. Well, I mean, he led. He led a bunch of laps. Yeah. Um, And then I I think they they got caught up in some stuff on a restart. Um, and then then ended up. I don't think he made it. I don't think he. I don't. I want to say he did not make it through the through the halfway break. He's a real nice guy. I've uh, I've talked to him before. He's uh he's always excited to come down for this race. Looks like we had some uh, pretty Sonny, Sonny Chopin, he uh he led pretty much the entire first half. And then uh, you know, something happened to him. Um, I think on a restart just after halfway, it was the second caution um, on lap fifty. And uh, he dropped back and he finished nineteenth. Yeah, I don't Did, he, didn't he have like water in his gas or something? Yeah, I think he had an, an issue with water in his gas. Um and um let's see, Ricky Ricky Locklear, he like he got caught up in in an he early up, Yeah, he got caught up in that big wreck out of turn four. Um, but he was actually able to fix his car and uh he got back out there and he ended up finishing fifteenth. Um yeah, Ricky than, Jr. was in that wreck too, I think, and he finished twenty first. Yeah. Man, all the other ones were just wreck after wreck after wreck. <laughs> <laughs> I, the pure stock four, that that was kind of I don't know, it was a little bit disappointing with those guys. I you know we ended up they ended up with so many wrecks and so many cautions that we that um the, the track staff cut the laps from forty to twenty. Yeah, that's kind of shocking, I think, just because, I mean, if you look at the top five finishers, um, they've all been to Dillon, and they've all, I think most of them up there pretty much all won at Dillon, too. Um, I'm just kind of surprised that they wrecked as much as they did. I mean, they knew that they had 40 laps. I mean, when do you see a pure stop four race go 40 laps? And, I mean, I just I just don't see why they couldn't have uh, just kind of rode for a little bit mm-hmm. until maybe the last 15 or so laps. But man, it took us, I swear it felt like an hour just to get the first nine done. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, and I think that's one of the, it's one of the fun things, but also something, you know, that we almost have to fight with when we, we take these. Uh, you know these classes like the pure stock four um like the street stocks that don't run well you know on average saturday night they're running 25 30 laps max all right and you put them in these long races and it i mean it can be almost torturous because they don't their mindset is when you drop the green flag i have to go as hard as i possibly can go yeah, I mean, in that race, you had guys on the apron. They just dived down in the apron in turn one and just, just hit the car up above them. Yeah. Uh, Dwayne Walker in the 48 ended up uh, ended up winning the pure stock four. And I don't know he's uh, he has he has won before at Dillon. He's won a good bit at Dillon, <clears throat> actually, I think. Um, and this has got to be close to, I don't know, he, he's won a lot since I've been there. Yeah. Let's see, Chargers. The asphalt versus dirt was a little bit interesting, but I don't. I think some of the dirt guys struggled pretty, pretty mightily. I'll tell you what, Robbie Disher didn't. He no, he was able to. Um, he was actually fun to watch because I think he had started to get it figured out. I saw him, and man, he was 
Yeah, that thing sideways like he was on the for a good bit. Yeah, he was fun watching him going into turn one because he was cutting down on the apron like like you would try in a light bottle. Yeah, it? and well and not in a light bottle, but like you would try on dirt to cut down low and, and get under somebody. Yeah, he, I, I'd be interested. I wish I knew who he was so I could see if that was you know, his first asphalt race or not. And that's his first asphalt race, man. He needs to get up dirt. <laughs> 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 asphalt car. Yeah. Um, Michael O'Brien in the 61 won that race. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that and, was one great finish. Yeah, it was. It was really. It was. That was probably it was the last race and it was probably the best finish of the night between him and the Bobby June in the 13 yeah, um, and finale Bobby June and he just about wrecked it coming out of town <laughs> I'm surprised that uh, Bobby lost I mean Bobby you know he's he's usually every other year local with Dylan and he knows how to get around there he's, he's won a good bit and I'm just surprised that uh, if Michael O'Brien guy uh I think this was possibly one of his first races at Dillon. Um, I'm just surprised he was able to outdo Bobby June. Well, I mean, I think that was just, it was one of those things. He, Bobby had been at the front for a lot, and and Michael had been kind of hanging out in the back, you know, working on him. And um, just, um, I, I think, I, I think, I want to say Michael got around him in an incident with a lap car, didn't he? Uh, there, I can't remember. I think so. I think it was yeah. over in turn two. And, uh... But I, uh, you know, during practice, uh, me and, and Darlington Raceway President Chip Wild were standing behind the gate over in turn one, and we were watching Bobby June, and uh, Bobby was just... He was passing people on the high side, the low yeah. side. He was just so much faster than everyone else. I just, I just can't believe he didn't win that race, especially after uh, you know, Michael Elliott had the issues he did. That took away um, it, what I thought was almost his only competition. If Michael definitely seemed like the, the car to beat, and I, I don't, I almost, you know, think that when they when they put him in the back, um, you know, like they did, that it, it, you know, just it just it broke his train of thought. It was a bit too much for him to overcome, and he ended up um, ended up finishing thirteenth. Um, and and I know that I know the track officials have caught a load of, of crap for that call. But you know what? You and I were both up there in the tower watching that. Yeah, Michael. You no, know, Michael. He's he's considered a local. You know, he yeah. races at, at Florence a good bit, but he races at Dillon a good bit too. And uh, you know, he knows the deal. He knows that if you jump and you know, enough times you get put in the back. And, you know, they were saying that he was jumping because the car beside him was wearing out his left side or right side. And, um, you know, he was, he said he was jumping just to get away from that second place car. But, you know, either way he jumped and you, you just can't do that. Especially after you've been warned. I mean, yeah, he was the warned. The officials told him about it. He, he was clearly warned. Well, the first time um, you know, you're going to have people on both sides I mean if track would have let him jump everyone would have complained and now you know his team's the only one complaining because well I mean I, I heard I did hear some other people you know walking through saying you know are y'all just going to let the nine car do that yeah you're just going to going to let him jump the start like that and uh you know, um, I, I, I hate it for him I, I do and I, I almost think some of it was the fact that it was so late and we wanted to get that race started and over with and he kept jumping the start and so you know it 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 was enough look we warned you you did it again we got to get this race going you got to go to the back yeah i mean if you think about it qualifying was over what three o'clock or something like that so i mean he didn't get in, into his car again until about 9 30 or so i mean that's uh i'm sure as a race car driver you're real antsy um after that long yeah 
Got NASCAR testing Thursday. Testing where? Where's NASCAR testing on Thursday? Uh, Daytona. Oh, testing in Daytona. That, that's right. They do start up Thursday. We'll be on Fox Sports One for a little bit. Outstanding. Always love watching that because there's always like one massive crash that takes out every. I think last year there was a crash that took out like almost everyone. Yeah, everybody's trying to be so uh, so careful and just turn some laps and uh, somebody always I guess they crashed last year because they had that new Gen 6 star they had no idea what was going to happen but there always seems to be just one crash yeah I think I watched it online last year and they streamed it live and we got uh, Wesley Outland from the uh, Mini Stock Mayhem on with us uh, had a pretty big race at Dillon this past weekend, didn't we? Yeah, Christopher Hunter, thanks for having me on. The Renegades and Dirt Modified Tour kicked off its third consecutive year at the Dillon Motor Speedway. And, you know, it's amazing that just there's such a great relationship with Ron Barfield and, uh, you know, the promoter, Andy Locklear, the race director of at Dillon Motor Speedway. He also does the announcing and, uh, you know, just how things have developed with what Chuck Ruffner and Brian Bryant and uh, myself have got going along with that whole deal. Um, I came on board at the end of... Uh, about the midpoint of last year i done some races off and on for the tour and uh i came on board to try to help them with uh, public relations and sponsorship and media and uh handling the websites and announcing amongst christopher and hunter all the other announcing gigs that i have <laughs> so i mean I, I wear a lot of hats so sometimes i forget where i'm at and what track i'm doing or if i'm on dirt or asphalt or drag racing but uh no no i i love racing and uh i'm i'm i you know if i can be a staple to help out with uh this sport that's all that matters to me yeah um we uh we we, we kind of talked about the pure stock and the street stock and uh charger race but um we didn't didn't talk much about the the uh, mayhem because i was gonna try and get you on here but uh um they, they started 20 cars and uh man i'll tell you what that mayhem put uh put on for a pretty doggone good show at Dillon this past weekend yeah and i'll tell you what too guys i want to give big, big kudos to the carolina uh, street stock challenge series man that was a big event there that they had they had 34 cars started 28 of them and uh you know that you know they had drivers all the way up from wisconsin of course milwaukee yep. wisconsin swan james or james swan went on to win in that 97 car driving for i believe it was jeff uh jeff melton yep um and of course um you know that just shows you the caliber of talent that comes in for that deal well we had the same thing for the renegade uh for the uh the four-cylinder mini stock uh, mayhem warriors event we had you know 20 something drivers come in there we had them from all over from north carolina south carolina virginia tennessee and of course um you know it was all said and done kevin pierce who is a very good friend of mine from stantonsburg's north carolina he raced at east carolina motor speedway and southern national you see him on the eastern part of north carolina but he's never really done a lot of traveling well him and michael rouse with rouse racing engines who does a lot of late model stuff hooked up at the last minute and put a motor in the car and came down there and man it paid off big and you know uh, it was a very competitive race he started fourth survived the caution flag fiestas that i think it seemed like all the <laughs> races had it dylan i don't know what in the world happened it was frigid arctic temperatures but it felt like there was a full moon above that racetrack for some reason so but it was a good show yeah an, uh, an outstanding show and uh, it was uh it, it was kind of nice to see you know especially in the uh you know top five or, or six seven cars there it was a pretty nice mix of of track veterans with kevin jackson finishing second and bailey miles finishing fourth and uh then you had um Kevin Pierce um, winning it, and Michael Wells, who who is not a regular, um, and uh, a couple of the other guys there. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, obviously in that mini stock mayhem race, being a regular was not necessarily uh, a, a huge advantage. No, you're exactly correct. And Hunter Thomas, I'll throw you in here too. Also, man, you know. I, I, I know that it was late getting started, but people just do not realize it. I know me and you both do because we've both done work at Rockingham Speedway before for for three years. I was the announcer in the booth for play-by-play -play for the Polar Bear 150, and then I was the pit reporter for another network uh, for the Polar Bear 150 before they had moved it to Thanksgiving weekend. Or I actually had done the first time they'd done it on Thanksgiving weekend, and then they'd done away with it. Um, and a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, when Andy Hillenberg decided 
to move the polar bear from New Year's Day to the, the weekend of Thanksgiving, that's when Ron Barfield stepped up and said, hey, I want to have a New Year's event. I see this thing's got potential, and, and thus this is where the whole Carolina Street Stock Series came about, the, the Carolina Asphalt Street Stock Series with Dwayne Weatherford. But, uh, Hunter, you were there pretty much the entire weekend, and a lot of people don't realize it, but – that track, whether Rockingham or Dillon, there's a lot of work that goes into trying to do a race in the winter time. Oh man, big time! Just because you know, you know, everyone just is kind of just over the holiday. Everyone's been spending time with family. A lot of people just, you know, as far as racers go, may not have been working on their cars as much as them from a track side. It's hard to get back into that groove. But it's really hard to get back into that crew when we have temperatures like we did, and uh, and it, it was just a great show. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean that the uh, the street stop race that Dylan uh, started right after uh, Andy Hillenberg uh, decided to change the date. I think my first polar bear race was uh, was that first date change. Uh, I don't think I saw one on the New Year's. And of course, as I said, you know it was a wet a wreck fest. Uh... You know, uh, Christopher, but bottom line, it was a great event. And as I said, as the announcer, I appreciate Andy Locklear and Hunter and everybody inviting us. And, uh, you know, I, I, what better thing to do on New Year's than be at the races? I mean, seriously, you know, I know there was an awesome BCS championship game last night between uh, Florida State whipping up on Auburn, you know, or as uh, the great Brent Musburger said, they gave him a dose of their own sweet medicine (laughs) after the (laughs) touchdown return. But, man, hey, my sweet medicine's racing, and and I – there was a great, great turnout of people that came to that race. And uh, same thing with the Mini Stock Mayhem Warrior Series. The fans, the drivers, the teams, they came out in full force. And, uh, you know, Kevin Jackson, you know, he's our defending champion. And, you know, he got involved in a wreck in the early going. And I thought he really messed up his car pretty good. It took him out. Well, they worked on the radiator. They had some overheating issues. Yes, it's 30 degrees outside, but they had overheating issues on their car. Uh, you know, if he came back, he rallied, fixed the car, and uh, was the runner-up. And I just think nobody could catch Kevin Pierce. He had a strong race car. Yeah, he he definitely did a a good bit of dominating. Um, you know, there were a couple that could could get close to him, but uh, getting close to him and getting around him were two entirely different things. Man, I'll tell you, it seems like Kevin Jackson he wins almost every race he he gets into. I think at Dillon one year he I think he almost won just about every uh, four cylinder race, and then he won at Florence and Myrtle Beach and all these other places. So uh, he. I'm surprised he didn't win this past weekend just because he, he's won so much at Dillon. And it's really, really difficult to beat him. And then uh, going back uh, with the New Year's, uh, I'm really glad that the uh, us as a group decided to run this race uh, the weekend after New Year's. That way everyone can enjoy the holiday and I'll come back refreshed for the race on Friday and Saturday. You know, there was a lot of wondering what was going to come out of that deal of, of running the race on New Year's Day because I even know in the past that Ron Barfield had the event on New Year's Day. And, yes, granted, okay, what what an awesome thing to be doing the first day of the year. They always say what you're doing the first day of the year is pretty much what you're going to be doing the entire year. <laughs> so what better thing to be at the racetrack? But it was on hump day, it was yeah. on Wednesday, and it was still during the middle of the holiday. People were still going to be out of work. I'm telling you guys, I do other radio shows and other racing stuff, and, and I normally take off for two to three weeks during the holidays. And uh, this this year, it seemed like it just it messed me up because, um, you know, it, it seemed like, okay, okay, I got two weeks off. Well, you got the holidays in the middle of the week, so it's like, well, you go through the holidays, then you got the weekend. So, but I think it was a great idea to come back and, and do the race on a Saturday. It was cold. They did have tire issues. The tire machine kept freezing up. The winterizing, people don't realize that word winterizing unless you want a winter time event. Um, it's just going to get better. The car counts are going to pick up. I think the first street stock race at Dillon only had like 14 cars back in 2011 when they first started this deal. And it's now moved to 34 cars. There's going to come a time where it's going to be 10,000 to win, I believe, at Dillon Motor Speedway. And you're probably going to see 150 street stock cars. And I'm glad that Ron Barfield and Dwayne Weatherford and everybody at Dillon Motor Speedway is giving the Mini Stock Mayhem Warrior Series, as well as the Street Stock guys, their, you know, their kudos because they put on some awesome racing. 
Yeah, they do. They they put on great shows, and you know, and a lot of times it's uh, you know it's tough on them on a on a normal Saturday night. You know, these guys will come to the track and and they they practice and put their cars together. And then they they'll race twenty twenty five laps. Right. And uh, so, you know, yeah, putting on a race like this where, where they're racing 100 laps, 50 laps, really showing the crowd, um, you know, what they can do. And, you know, and, and, and talking about the crowds and, you know, we had some dedicated fans that came out and braved the cold. And, and you think that it doesn't that that the drivers don't realize it. But uh, Hunter and I interviewed um, uh, we interviewed James Swan um, earlier. Uh, who, who won the street stock race and he noticed and 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 made a comment to us about you know how impressed he was with those fans who were sitting in the stands not in their cars but sitting in the stands braving that cold to watch that race oh yeah yeah it's uh, i mean it's amazing i mean you know here's my thing and i've always said this i don't and i just don't get it guys i don't get it if we've got so many fans out there that love racing like they say they do, then why in the world can we not get a packed house to come to Dillon Motor Speedway or Coastal Plains or, you know, Southern National or Rockingham or anywhere for a big, big race, but you can pack the grandstands out for a football game? I don't <laughs> – I just don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't know if it's the reason of – Throwing a football through the air is more exciting than seeing a car fly by you in a catch fence. I don't understand it. I'll never understand it, Hunter Thomas. I, I mean, I, I think if, if tracks would step up and if the fans would step up like Dillon Motor Speedway fans do for big, big races in the wintertime like this New Year's Eve event, that was a successful race. I mean, I, I, I talked to Ron Barfield and Dwayne Weatherford after. There was no disappointment. They felt like they were happy with the car count, with the fan count. No, it wasn't a standing room only packed house, but the fans did come out for that event. And was it cold as hell? Yes, Oof. it was cold. Uh, that, that same cold weather that is, you know, that visited, that's visiting us now was just the brunt of what came through that's here visiting us now. That started on Saturday. So, um, and, I, and I, I, I did feel kind of bad for you over there. You were, you were in the other side of the, of the broadcast booth, or the other side of the booth up in uh, Dillon. And yeah. early on in in the day, the uh, the heater shorted out over there. Yeah. And so we had heat on our side, but you you guys were a little bit cold over on the other side. And then to top it off, somebody shuts the door when I start talking. So it's all good. <laughs> no, it's all good. I, I know why. Hey, listen, I, I, that's what I told somebody. If you think it's cold outside, come on up here in the booth, literally where I am. There's a little chill up here, too. So, no, no, in all seriousness, um, look, I'll stand out there and, 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 and announce a race till my fingers are frozen numb if I have to, just to, you know, just to be able to do it. Uh, it's just... Uh, Hey, it just comes with it. But I, I really believe that if we have fan support of the mini stock mayhems and of the street stocks and of this New Year's race at Dillon, Christopher and Hunter, I believe that it can grow to be something bigger. And we got to have the support from the fans. Yep. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've done a race a couple of weeks ago up in Mercer, Pennsylvania, and I'm not trying to plug any racetracks or whatnot, but they have a race called the Jack Frost 150. It is a 200-lap enduro race, mm. not street stocks, enduro cars. This is run what you brung, hope mm. it's a piece of junk, and it can at least get to 200 laps. And the first car that's left standing wins. It paid $1,000 to win. And it's one race only. They had 80 cars. It was covered in snow, but the grandstands were full at that at that uh, three eighth mile dirt track, Mercer Raceway Park. Now that is that's fans coming out in full force, Hunter, and that type of dirt track fans that they have at Mercer for that Jack Frost 150. We have got to build up even bigger at Dillon and even develop more and more, of course, at um, you know at other racetracks throughout the southeast. Yeah, I think uh, I think one thing that hurts, uh, not for the January race, but just in general, is uh, you know Dillon High School, uh, they're three-time defending champions in football, and uh, you know that's a uh, that's a big deal uh, for Dillon County. And uh, if you give them a choice between uh, a race or a football game, they're going to choose the football game. Uh, but I think it has more so with uh, I guess my age group, maybe a little bit older. Uh, there's just more things to do on a Saturday night than to go out to the racetrack me i just i just grew up loving racing and uh, i think it's just as far as getting more people out i think it's uh targeting um you know that younger group because obviously with 
with 20 and 30 degree weather, um, some of the older individuals and maybe the new parents who have babies, uh, they just can't come out in that kind of weather. Well, I'm one of those fans that uh, and, and announcers that, you know, I announce high school football, and I do some Division II college football from Mount Olive and Campbell University. And I'll tell you this much. If the opportunity comes to either do a football game or a race, I'm doing the race twice, any day of the week and twice on Sunday. And it don't matter whether it's 20 degrees or 100 degrees, I'm doing the race, <laughs> point blank. Um, I just like racing better than, than you know, the other stick and ball sports, not taking anything against it. And hopefully I don't get fired for, you know, if the boss at the TV station hears me saying this. But, you know, bottom line, I mean, I, I just uh, – racing's in your blood. And it's, it's, it's a drive. It's a passion. And Christopher and Hunter, you both know what I'm talking about. When it's in your blood, whether you're a scorer or you're an announcer or you're a PR writer or whether you're a flagman like the great job that Timmy Hudson done this weekend. And, of course, he's the official flagman for the National Pass Series or – anything um whether just being a fan in the stands when you're hooked you're hooked oh, it doesn't yeah. matter no uh, question you'll about pull it out, you'll pull out the burn barrel you'll pull out the heaters you'll pull out an electric heater and plug it up to a damn power plug to the <laughs> tower if you want to just to you know to stay warm i mean and uh you'll dress up like an eskimo and you know in that weather and that's what i love so much those fans that came out and i and i said that in closing those that stayed there for that demolition crash fest with the dirt cars on asphalt uh. with the chargers i told them i said get on your feet and give yourselves a round of applause maybe just clapping your hands and warm your hands up a little bit because y'all stayed out there and and i know i looked at ron and he was disappointed guys and we were in the booth and i know the show got drug out a little longer than expected but listen when you're running in those type of hazardous well let me take that back not hazardous when you're when you're competing and doing events in that type of winter conditions you have to, you know, ex- expect the unexpected and roll with what goes on. And, yeah, if it was my opinion, and I hope this doesn't make anybody mad, I wouldn't have done all that qualifying. Me, I'm a heat race person. I- I've done a lot of racing up in the Northeast announcing this year, and uh, I have become accustomed to the hell with qualifying. I want to see heat races, you know. And uh, I think if maybe the idea came of doing more heat racing instead of the single car qualifying, I think that could have made the show go a lot quicker. But all in all, it, it was a it was a great event. It was Absolutely. a great event. Absolutely, it, it was. Yeah, I was. Um, I talked to Howard Goodson, uh, the father of a uh, uh, two-time NASCAR Slim Jim All Pro Champion, Hal Goodson. He oh, yeah. told me at he told me at uh, at Dillon back when it was a dirt track. They used to. Um, I can't remember what it was, but they used to set something kind of on fire, and the uh, the grandstands were actually heated uh, back in the day, back hmm. in the '60s and whatnot. Should have figured that out for this weekend. <laughs> maybe they put coal in my leg or not, but maybe they put coals. Maybe they put railroad coals under the stands and, and, and <laughs> put them suckers on there. I don't. You know, they, no, they have been joking, but I don't, I don't think he was. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we need to do that. Well, Wes, we appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you coming on and giving us a few minutes talking about the mini stock mayhems. Yeah, I know we we dabbed a little bit more about the whole racing stuff, man. I I, I love any and everything, and I kind of I'm one of those guys that'll be talking racing with you, and then I'll say squirrel, and we'll talk <laughs> about something else with racing. But uh, no, Kevin Pierce was your winner. Kevin Jackson was second. Michael Wells was third. Bailey Miles was in fourth, and Andrew Sanders fifth. Bobby Tumbleston, John uh, Jason Tuttero. He had a mechanical issue. He came back. Michael Wells. He had a problem. He was leading the race, missed a gear or something before halfway, and he lost pack of the crowd. And and uh, after that break. He started to come back. He did finish third. Uh, Tumbleston, Bobby Tumbleston, sixth. Jason Tuttero, seventh. Randy uh, Knipe was eighth. Tyler McDonald, ninth. And uh, Chris Hitu, the top ten. Murphy, uh, Bone, Sanders, Fulford, Tucker, Clements, Jones, Bryant, and Milligan was the full field rundown. And that race saw 15 caution flags in the 50-lap race. So there was 20 caution flags or 21 <laughs> caution flags in a 100-lap race. So I just, you know, hey, that it happens. But, uh no, thanks for having me on, Hunter and Christopher, and uh, we'll do it again next year. And, uh, of course, you can go to um, – let me throw out the social media stuff. There you, you go. You can go to ministockmayhemwarriors.com, the official website, ministockmayhemwarriors.com, or you can go to our, follow us on Facebook at ministockmayhem, and you can also go to ministockmayhem on Twitter and uh, keep up with the series. And uh, we should be back at Dillon probably sometimes, maybe twice in 2014. I know there was some – talks about maybe being a part of the big july 4th event that that goes on there we might do a summer event uh, on a july 4th holiday and i know we'll definitely be a part of the uh 
the 11th annual Fall Spectacular yep. 400. No question. Yeah. All right. We appreciate it. We'll no, look, thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate we'll, it. Enjoy the rest of your weir, year. Stay warm, everybody. Stay warm. <laughs> Just be thinking about racing. It'll be here before you know it. Yep, right around the corner. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Wes. All right, thanks, Wes. Absolutely, guys. Y'all take care. All right, thanks a lot. All right, bye-bye. Bye. That'll do it for this week's episode of the Fourth Turn Podcast. Make sure you stay up to date with all the latest racing news at thefourthturn.com. You can follow us on Twitter at The Fourth Turn and find us on Facebook at The Fourth Turn. Thanks for listening.